All right, let us say hello to the great John Anik. And we didn't get to link up ahead of UFC 279, but he is kind enough to join us a few days later. And John, look, you have been a part of some crazy fight weeks. UFC 223 really sticks out in Brooklyn. And oftentimes there's shakeups and shuffle ups and all that good stuff. But how did it feel to have a fight week like this where everything went totally smooth and swimmingly like this one did? Oh my gosh, this was wild. <laughs> <laughs> this takes the cake, you know, and, and certainly Joe Rogan and DC and everybody else, I think, would tend to agree. It's interesting because foundationally, it seemed like they protected themselves with these two additions to the fight card three weeks out. But uh, never in any wild scenario could you have possibly predicted that it would have unfolded like this. Now, perhaps they got ahead of themselves in terms of that protection in the middle of the night when obviously Hamza Chimaev have had what we now know was a, a really difficult weight cut. Um, but credit to all six athletes, you know, I would like to shout out Kevin Holland in particular. I mean, the leech certainly for sure. We've all been acknowledging the leech and the weight discrepancy, but, uh, you know, Kevin Holland may get back to the Hamza Chimaev fight, but don't you think it would have been nice for him to be able to prepare for that effing guy, right? Um, who I think is the most dominant force in the game. Uh, love to see Nate Diaz, be able to have that moment. Uh, and I do think Tony was, um, you know, maybe more competitive than certain people are giving him credit. So uh, that's where I stand. And uh, obviously excited to uh, re-rack it a little bit with you, my man. Yeah. I mean, absolute insanity. Well, let's go backwards a little bit because we all know it went down Thursday at the press conference. It actually seems like five years ago at this point that that all went down because Friday, that's when this story sort of wrote multiple chapters in the crazy book that is UFC 279 because we were getting word, as did a lot of other people, that before the weigh-ins, Hamzat was having trouble making weight. Then as things were happening on the scales, we're starting to hear that this wasn't going to be your ordinary miss. This wasn't going to be a pound, a pound and a half. This is going to be somewhere in the eight to 10 pound range. And you're the MC of this damn thing. You're there shouting everything out. What was going through your mind? Like, Were you privy to any of this? Did you know that Shemaev might show up, not just overweight, but this much overweight? Well, I was sworn to secrecy by the great Joe Rogan, who called me at 930 in the morning and suggested that this is what Dana White was trying to do. And I appreciated that because at that point in time, I was in the dark, you know, and every time I would come out, the media is looking for something. And I'm saying, oh, no, it's, uh, you know, Rene Aldana and Macy Gaston, <laughs> we're going to fight at a catch weight of 140 pounds. And um, Mark Raimondi and others are looking at me like, is that it, bro? Is that, is that the update right now? Um, it was wild. Uh, and then, you know, my enthusiasm at the possibility of this new fight card quickly went to a little bit of anxiety in terms of some of the voiceover work that needed to be done with immediacy, like the way in introduction and everything else. But uh, all's well that ends well, for better or for worse. Our whole live production team is conditioned to uh, to a circumstance like this. And I, I would agree with people that would say, at least from a competition standpoint, for the most part, uh, the fight card took on a more competitive look after the fact. But uh, I don't know, man, in terms of wildness during fight week, um, UFC 279 will be hard to top, I would think. You, I mean, you seem to be somewhat privy of what the plans might be, but might is not a word we throw out very confidently in MMA. So what would you say, like, what was the rest of your day like? Are you like the rest of us just checking your phone for hours on end, hoping to get some kind of confirmation, some kind of finality on all of these things? Because you have to call this thing the next day. It was uh, very inordinary, you know? I mean, I was on set to host UFC Live for about 90 minutes. That show got canceled because we didn't have confirmation in totality. And, and ultimately that show was going to air at, I think, 2.30 p.m. Pacific at a 3 p.m. Pacific. Dana White went on Sports Center and ultimately made the announcement. Um, but before I went to MGM Grand to, to host that show that I never ended up hosting, uh, I went back to my room to rewrite and then revoice the way in introduction. You know, UFC fans, we'd like to welcome you to the way in for UFC 279, Shimaya versus Diaz. That doesn't work anymore. Um, so I uh, went back and revoiced that and revoiced the Aldana Shasson fight. Uh, because all Bantamweight mentions needed to be out of the pre-voiced combo feature. Uh, you know, NFL no announcers probably listen to this thinking, you know, let's, yeah, we do pre-voiced elements. Our in-house show is inexorably linked with our live production telecast. So, um, yeah, it was a wild Friday, man. Can't remember one like that. That's for sure. And then Saturday, I, I want to start with Chris Barnett because that guy, I mean, we, we talked about the weight misses and stuff like that. And I even signed off our preview show by saying, listen, we, we, we don't like the weight misses, but if there's one guy who I'm going to give a pass to, it's going to be this guy because 
not just because he's such a jolly guy and he's just is so good for the sport with his positivity, but this man has gone through the ringer over the last year. Everything that he's gone through in his life, the Martin Boudet fight on top of everything else. And to me, I was like, you know what? I'm giving this guy a pass with everything. And then he goes out there. He looks like he's about to be done against Jake Collier. And then all of a sudden he comes back and wins the fight. We see the patented somersault flip right on the, the keister and all hell breaks loose. What, what was that like to watch it and just, just call that moment because it was something special and it really sort of amped everything back up for the rest of the night. Yeah. I mean, Justin Taffa missed weight, but he didn't weigh this number. So this was a record setting weigh in day for Chris Barnett, who was still dripping. That's the thing. It was sort of this weird circumstance whereby he was still dripping. He was still sweating. And he said verbally, I'm going to keep sweating, but just couldn't, you know, cut that final pound and a half. But yeah, you just got to feel so good for the guy and just really knows how to maximize a microphone. You know, I was talking to someone recently who suggested that Conor McGregor is an amazing athlete, but Conor McGregor's ability to articulate himself in the moment and say things that are not pre-rehearsed. That's probably the most elite ability that Conor McGregor has. And I would agree, you know, as an orator myself, I marvel, you know, at Conor McGregor. And I think Chris Barnett, every chance he gets on a microphone, you know, he makes you want more. And that says nothing of his fantastic gymnastics to, to quote Dora the Explorer. So uh, yeah, no, great night for Chris Barnett. And, you know, he has a knack for coming through on these big shows, right? I mean, the John Vellante fight was at friggin' Madison Square Garden. And then obviously this was a massive pay-per-view for uh, for myriad reasons. So uh, yeah, good on Beast Boy, Chris Barnett. Good win for Johnny Walker. I think he shut a lot of people up with that performance. Submission against Iwan Kutalaba, but Irini Aldana, man, that up kick, it was like watching a new Japan pro wrestling show because Chaeson collapses and it's just like, you could hear if you dropped a quarter out of your pocket on the ground, we would have heard it. Like it was just, no one knew what happened. So you're trying to figure it out. You finally get to see the replay. What is your reaction to that? Because I've never seen a finish quite like that before. Well, it had never happened before in UFC history. We've had up kick knockouts, but not to the body like that. So it was a UFC first. I said injury. And then it wasn't until the replay that I understood exactly what had happened with the heel right to the liver, I believe. But, uh, you know, it sounds trite when I say an athlete has mental fortitude, but Irene Aldana has shown you time and time again uh, that she really is one of these competitors. Like she wants to be in there. Uh, even when a round isn't going her way, we've seen time and time again that she stays in that round and, you know, stays mindful and, and in tune with her weapons. And immediately when Joe Rogan asked her about this weapon, you know, they're always talking about trying to be dangerous from all positions. So, um, you know, she went for that spot and didn't miss. And, uh, you know, I think she was the one who was closer to 135 pounds, right? This was moved to a catchweight fight. For all intents and purposes, they they move them forward both as bantamweight contenders. But um, you know, Aldana has sort of built herself back up since that main event against Holly Holm, and um, you know, I do think she's closing in on a championship opportunity. Ketlin Vieira is going to have something to say about that. But uh, 135 pounds is ripe. You know, just when you think right that a cupboard is bare, all of a sudden now you kind of need to do a, a trilogy with Juliana Pena and Amanda Nunes, and now you have two people who are worthy of a title shot in my mind in Ketlin Vieira and Irene Aldana. So uh, I guess that's kind of the way it goes. The, the tension of the night was certainly at speak for the co-main event, and we'll get to that in a moment. But I, I want to jump ahead to Tony Ferguson versus Nate Diaz because to me, and I, and I don't know what it's like from a broadcast perspective, but watching Tony make the walk and then watching Nate make the walk, I felt this sort of calm over me for a main event that I just haven't really felt in a long time because... And it was one of the best feelings I've ever had heading into a main event that I can remember because this is just like fun. It's two guys that we have watched for years, put on fun fights, two guys who are wily veterans. They're beloved by the fans. There's no real high stakes. There's no high pressures. Like it's yeah. just two dudes getting in there, playing the hits, hitting each other. And that's what we got for however long this fight lasted. Like there's no overthinking this. Some people are picking this apart from a technical aspect. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, just enjoy what we're getting here. This is fun stuff. Like, what was the pre-fight feeling like for you? Because you're coming off of Shamaya versus Holland. All eyes are on Shamaya. And now we're getting to this fight between Nate and Tony. What's the pre-fight feeling like for you when, when these guys are making the walk out? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting take by you because maybe it didn't have that championship tension that we are so accustomed to. And Nate Diaz has had one of the most successful UFC careers of all time, and it's not even measured by wins and losses or championships per se. So I do think there's something to what you're saying. Uh, I can't necessarily speak to any lack of uh, 
personal tension in the moment because the pageantry and everything that comes with a UFC main event for me uh, will always just be crazy. You know, that's why I'm so high on, you know, Hamza Chimaya because from my seat, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like it, but you know, I feel good for both Nate and Tony. You know, I understand that Tony on paper has five consecutive red stripes on his Wikipedia page, you know, but he got a lot done and might've been a leg kick or two against anybody else away from winning this fight. Nate's just too goddamn tough. Um, but for Nate to have this moment, you know, it's a big moment for Brazilian jiu-jitsu and submission offense and modern day mixed martial arts. And, um, you know, certain guys, man, they got these chokes and there's a lot of guys in the top 15 that don't have chokes and don't have signature submissions. So, uh, very happy for Nate and, uh, very rare situation where you have a free agent on his level, um, you know, sort of at the top of, uh, of the fight game right now, you know, with Conor McGregor on the men, uh, Nate Diaz is the biggest superstar in, uh, in combat sports right now. Yeah, this is this is no Gamrat Sarukian. We knew it wouldn't be, but it was still just really fun to watch. Like I knew it wasn't exactly the same, but I kind of compared it to like the Tyson Roy Jones fight because I mean it wasn't the same. The stakes are different. This is like an actual fight, it wasn't an exhibition, but two right. guys out here playing the hits. And then to see Nate just slap on the gilly and get the tap, and then he hits the overhead bicep pose, like, and then he cuts the perfect promo on the way out. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh man, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. And then he puts the company over, puts everybody else over. This was just kind of, I left the night feeling this is the way it was supposed to happen. Yeah. And look at Nate Diaz's legacy, right? That might not be finished in the UFC. I mean, certainly he not only left the door ajar, but kind of, laid the infrastructure for a comeback, but 16 UFC wins, 10 of them by submission. And I heard a big narrative coming into the fight. And again, a lot of it was granted fight in Kamzat Shimaev and not Tony Ferguson, which physically is different, but, oh, you know, Nate hasn't submitted anybody in a while. And, you know, Nate Diaz is so hard to put away, right? This is not breaking news, but, you know, when I was handicapping in my hotel room on Friday night, the new fight between Tony Ferguson and Nate Diaz, um, you know, I thought it was going to be exceedingly hard for Tony to put Nate away. And Bilal Muhammad would tell you that the leg kick game is a toughness game in terms of uh, the person who's absorbing them. And maybe that's not always the case when it comes to the perennial nerve and certain things that can go wrong. But generally speaking, um, you know, I've seen a lot of guys limping all night from those calf kicks. And uh, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Nate wasn't even limping super physically and mentally tough. And, um, you know, I would like to see Tony uh, get a matchup that is, uh, you know, pretty favorable in that top 25 and give him a chance to uh, showcase his skills. Cause uh, you know, it's not as though his last two fights, Tony's were not without some merit. So. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I suggested just, let's just throw them in there with, throw them in there with like Joe Lozon, like let them two just bang it out for a while. And it's just fun. And if Tony yeah. wins, like that's a good win. Like even today, that's a good win. We haven't seen Joe fight in a while, but that win over JSP that Joe had has aged extremely well. So throw those two guys in there. They'll scrap it up. And if Tony wins, gets him back in the wind column and then we could start yeah. moving them up. So like yeah, it's a good idea. And, and uh, you mentioned that the door's ajar for Nate Diaz. And a lot of people have been asking me, like, will he come back? So do you think he's going to come back? Like, if he wants to and, and they can all come to terms, it seems like they all left on the right note. I'm in. If it's the right matchup, I'm in. But as you know, John, in this sport, in the UFC specifically, we don't usually get happy endings in the UFC. And I just don't know at 37 years of age, the mileage he has on, I'm not saying he shouldn't fight ever again, because there's a lot of money to be made for that, man. I just don't know if he could have written a better ending to the UFC chapter of his life. No, I agree. And there are a lot of people who think I'm looking at the fight through rose colored glasses. And, you know, even Ray Longo, who's on our podcast every week, you know, kind of felt like there were sad components to the fight and felt like they kind of looked old and slow, you know. Um, so maybe I am waxing a little bit optimistic as far as that fight is concerned. And you're right. I mean, it's hard to believe that he could go out on, on a higher note, uh, but he's still competitive. He's Nate is still competitive and uh, it's mixed martial arts. I mean, certainly boxing is a different story, but uh, to my earlier point, you know, he enters a boxing setting, you know, he relinquishes a lot of the skills that he spent a lifetime developing, you know, um, you take him down, you know, the danger factor is pretty high with Nate off of his back. So, uh, you know, even when you talk about him and Conor McGregor engaging in some sort of combat sports setting, uh, I think for Nate, it should be MMA, you know? So, uh, I'm hopeful that he'll be back for one, but if not, uh, hell of a way to go out, you know, we were talking, I don't know if it was Dean Thomas, but Chris Lytle, uh, went out in a pretty good way, but it's hard to go out on top, so to speak. 
Yeah, even even in a loss, Luke Rockhold went out about as as good as about as this is about as good of a moral victory as you can get in the sport, yeah. especially in the UFC, especially in your retirement fight. You didn't win, but you wanted a lot of people's hearts, and I yeah. guess you could find some value in that. But let's go back to Shemaev because I mean, the whole card was essentially shifted around for this man to still compete, and. A lot of people, myself included, I was wondering if the chaos of the week may have just gotten to him on fight night. And I felt like if Kevin Holland could survive seven minutes, this could be really, really interesting because Kevin can push those buttons with the trash talk and get under yeah. people's skin. But Shamayev just didn't give him a chance to say or do anything. He just manhandles Kevin Holland, who to Kevin's credit is a G and he fought his ass off. But man, this guy, Hamza Shamayev, John, the physical tools, the athleticism, the strength, the skills, and just he's still a little bit green in the sport. He's only been doing this pro for like three or four years. I agree with you. I don't know if I've ever seen anything quite like him. And if he can get between the ears to get anywhere near his physical attributes, how do you stop this dude? So I'm not an odds maker, right? And I believe that a betting line between him and Kamaru Usman, right? And I say that with respect to Leon Edwards, it seems like a fight between Shimaev and Leon Edwards, for example, that Shimaev would be the betting favorite. But even against Kamar Usman, it stands to reason that he could be the betting favorite. Now, we finally have intel on Shimaev and the weight cut from Andreas Michael, I believe, courtesy of ESPN MMA. Seems like his next fight before the year is out is going to be at 185 pounds. So there's a whole other discussion now to be had. But in terms of the prospect, and you maybe want to suggest that he's no longer a prospect, but in terms of the contender and the performer, I've never seen anything like it, you know, and nor has Dana White in a lot of respects, you know, and I think we've both been criticized to whatever degree for, uh, you know, giving him the public credit that we have given him. I mean, say what you want about the weight miss, right? And certainly I'm not a fighter, right? So I think for professional athletes, his contemporaries, they look at this through a completely different lens than I do, right? Like for Kenny Florian, who stared death in the face twice, trying to make 145 pounds, right? It's hard to have, you know, a long leash of uh, acceptance for something like this. Um, but I think he's a middleweight, certainly looks like a middleweight. You know, I thought it was in great shape coming into this fight. He certainly remains the hardest worker in the room. Like work ethic is not an issue, but he doesn't seem to have an appetite for the weight cut. He seems to be a super stubborn guy, but I think he's the most dominant force in the game right now, you know, and there's a ferocity to his game that perhaps didn't totally exist with Khabib Nurmagomedov. I mean, Khabib was maybe more meticulous and certainly an absolute bear in there. Don't get me wrong, but Kamzat Shimaev is, uh, is absolutely exceptional. I, I just cannot wait to see him now, um, you know, after this incredible performance against Kevin Holland, whom I respect uh, a great deal, um, you know, to fight an elite middleweight. And now we can start matchmaking. It's too bad he was so dismissive of the Robert Whitaker fight because it makes a shit ton of sense. Oh, man. I, I've i been saying it for like two or three weeks now. Like if if we expected him to go out and, and probably beat Nate, which would have been sad in a lot of ways, but who knows? The things can happen in a fight. But I was suggesting because of the holdup at 170, because we have a title fight at 185 and if Pereira happens to win, they're probably going to rerun that. Just have him fight Rob because if he beats Whit if he beats Whitaker, he's the number one contender in two divisions. And how much fun is that? It could be like a high school standout football player sitting in his house with two hats deciding which one to pick. It, like you could just make a whole fun storyline out of that. And if Whitaker won, then no matter if Izzy wins or whoever, he's fighting for the belt. You beat Hamza Shemaev, you get a title shot. But hearing Shemaev say what he said about Robert Whitaker, and then hearing Robert Whitaker respond in such saying, yeah, I'll train with this guy. I actually am over the fight altogether. And I yeah. hope these guys get to train together because I think Robert Whitaker and just having his presence of mind and just picking his brain a little bit, that can, I mean, that is certainly not going to hurt Hamza. In fact, it'll help him a ton. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm sitting here thinking too bad that uh, Adesanya's got the two head-to-head -head wins over Robert Whitaker. You can almost open an 195-pound division just based upon where Whitaker and Chimaev are right now in their careers and have them fight for a belt. But uh, let us not get ahead of ourselves because I don't need any more divisions, you know. I'm kind <laughs> of uh, aligned with Dana on that. But, um, you know, now I think we at least have some clarity and it's going to be a middleweight. And uh, I don't disagree in terms of your sentiments for uh, Whitaker and Chimaev helping each other and getting better. But uh, yeah, I mean, what's going to happen out 185 pounds because Alex Pereira is a, is a big boy. And uh, I see Chimaev in there and he looks like a middleweight to me. And, um, you know, I always thought he could make welterweight selectively here and there, but to make it and be the champion and 
carry yourself in that division and live the lifestyle that's going to allow you to make 170 pounds, not 71 if you're the champ in theory, three times a year. I just didn't think that was ever sustainable for, for Hamza. Um, but, you know, I think he's uh, probably a top five middleweight right now. And, and it sounds like he's probably going to get the chance to prove that. Yeah. Paul Cost is right there. You got footage, you got everything. You don't need, you don't need to really do anything. Just put these two guys on a poster and let them go and squash okay. it in the octagon. Yep. I love it. Um, last thing I want to touch on before I let you go, we, we all the talk about Li Jing Liang and how he got the short straw pretty much across the board. A lot of people felt like he was, even him, he wore the Rob t-shirt on the MMA hour yesterday and didn't get to wear the blue suit at the press conference and, and everything that happened. But I feel like D-Rod is just getting just destroyed here. And it's through no fault of his own because he's getting chastised because people felt like Lee won the fight. He's the guy that weighed more, but it had nothing to do with him. It's just the way the card was shuffled. And D-Rod, I just feel like while Lee got the short end of the stick and his stock has risen, D-Rod goes out, gets a win, and his stock has dropped in a lot of people's eyes because he just happened to weigh more than the guy he fought the guy he wasn't supposed to fight in the first place. So I kind of feel bad for D rod. I feel bad for Lee, but I do feel bad for D rod too, because guys been out for 13 months comes in, has a competitive fight with a really good dude. And he won no matter how people scored it. Yeah, I think that's fair. And shout out to D rod, the Kobe Bryant guy, you know, these LA kids who grew up adoring Kobe uh, have a special place in my heart because I loved Kobe to such an extent, but yeah, I can understand that line of thinking. Um, but it happens a lot, even when there aren't weight circumstances like this, right? Like, there were times in Paul Felder's career where people thought he beat Edson Barboza. So you're the talk of the town, but then maybe in the rematch, you get the nod over him and people think Edson beats you. And then everybody's crapping on you while you're eating your cheeseburger, celebrating your win, you know? So it's sort of a weird thing for D rod, you know, to have to publicly come out and now say, all right, you know, everybody banging on me, let's do a rematch, which by the way, I don't think we need to see. I don't think it really has this monumental impact on either guy. I think both of them have a broader appeal now i think both of them got a lot of shine this weekend i think they're both top 15 welterweights and uh you know i just don't know that the leech loses all that much i think financially obviously he was probably compensated um but yeah you know it's hard to uh to have to look at that as a loss for the rest of your career but there's definitely a d-rod side to it no doubt about it you're right when are we back in the booth are you off until 280 now so I have some other obligations, but yes, no, I have uh, October 1st, Yan Xiaonan, Mackenzie Dern made an event at the Apex. And then, uh, and then yes, Abu Dhabi for UFC 280. All right. Well, what do you else you got going on? Can you talk about that or no? I cannot, but um, I did play golf today and, um, you know, I hit some of the best shots of my life, but I also lost eight <laughs> golf balls. So um, not ideal. Eight golf balls, put 12 in my bag, lost eight. So, uh, but yeah, no, a little downtime with the kids and, uh, which is nice. And, um, the real work as you know, so, um, yeah, just going to enjoy the rest of the fall. You know, the first half of the year was pretty heavy. So my schedule, uh, lightens up and, uh, my vocal cords are probably not complaining. There you go, John, you're the man. Appreciate this very much. Glad to get your side of everything because we've seen, we've gotten everybody else side, but nice to, to get a different view on things, a view that I respect because being in broadcasting, I, I I was more curious about what you were going through than the fighters half the time, sure. which is kind of weird, but uh, appreciate it very much, man. Enjoy the time off and uh, we'll see you back in the booth October 1st. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it.